Being able to troubleshoot memory problems is important because if there's a memory leak either in the operating system or a device driver or a process, ultimately that's going to degrade performance and may uh, cause processes to fail and or the system even to hang or fail. So some of the questions we're going to answer for you and show you how to troubleshoot are how do you determine if you've got a memory leak? And if you do decide you've got a memory leak, is it a process leaking memory or is it something in kernel mode? Is it the system or a driver? How do you know if you need more physical memory on your system? A common question people ask. How do you size your paging file? Probably even a more common question with lots of incorrect advice out there floating around out there. And finally, how do you understand all the memory counters that you see in the various tools that you might use like Task Manager or Perfmon? Now first, let's just define some basic uh, terms and concepts in regard to the Windows Memory Manager. The Windows Memory Manager provides the illusion to each process and also to the operating system that there's a flat virtual address space, when in fact there's more often than not much less physical memory in the machine than there is virtually presented to the process. On 32-bit windows, if you do the math, 2 to the 32 is 4 gigabytes, or about 4 billion bytes. If you uh, do the same math for a 64-bit system, a 64-bit address space actually provides 17 billion gigabytes. We're going to see later that of that 17 billion, a much smaller portion is currently accessible by the 64-bit architectures. And even a little bit less than that is available to Windows because of some of the implementation details of the current 64-bit version. Now, you probably heard the term page, paging file. Where does the term page come from? Well, the hardware memory management unit on today's microprocessors provide a way for the operating system to map virtual addresses to physical addresses. And it does that in the granularity of a page. Now, on the x86 architecture, you might be familiar with the size of a page as being 4 kilobytes. And that's true in most cases, but the x86 and the 64-bit architectures that Windows runs on also provide an option called large pages. Large pages allow the operating system to map a larger range of virtual memory with a single mapping entry, which provides a performance advantage. So there are small pages, 4K on x86 and also on the x64 platform. The two implementations being Intel's EM64T and AMD's AMD64 architecture. And on the Itanium, small pages are 8 kilobytes in size. Large pages are 4 megabytes on the x86 and the x64, and 16 megabytes on the Itanium platform. So the memory manager in Windows has some of the characteristics of any memory manager you'd expect of a modern OS. For example, it uh, implements a demand-paged virtual memory subsystem, which is Another uh, way of saying that it's a lazy allocator. In other words, if you launch an application like Notepad or Notepad loads a DLL, Windows doesn't simply go fetch the entire contents of that executable image or DLL into physical memory. It does it as the application demands, as Notepad executes and touches code pages, as it touches data pages. It's at that point that the memory manager will go and can make a connection between virtual memory and some physical memory reading and contents off disk as needed. That's, by the way, I found a common misconception that when you run an executable that it reads the whole image off the disk. Right, and I think what contributes to that is the, the term load DLL, for example, because that's a virtual loading of the DLL, not a physical loading of the DLL into memory. Now, you know FileMon, actually, because it shows uh, paging activity can be used to illustrate this fact. So I'm going to go run FileMon and set the filter to an image that I know for sure, Mark, you haven't run since you rebooted your system earlier. Uh, solitaire. Okay. Solve.exe. So now Solve.exe currently is on the disk. When I run it, we'll see that Solitaire, as it starts up, is causing page faults to pieces of its own executable that are being read off the disk on demand. So I'm going to click Start, Run, Sol, go back to the file mon trace, uh, stop the logging, and just scroll back towards the top, go down a little bit till we see some entries for Solve.exe, and uh, Sure enough, here is an example that I've highlighted of Sol reading Sol. So this is an example of a process basically faulting itself off the disk on demand as uh, Solitaire was initializing. Now, as I, if I went to back to Solitaire and continue to use various features, we might see additional page reads from Sol.exe. Likewise, if we go back to the display, we see Sol.exe reading from cards.dll several times. Those were references to a library that was loaded virtually, as you explained, Mark, but now physically is being brought in on demand as pieces of that DLL are being used. Another attribute of the Windows Memory Manager is that it implements intelligent automatic sharing of memory. So another misconception people have is if you run two copies of Notepad, that there's two copies of the Notepad image and associated DLLs in physical memory. 
Windows Memory Manager is smart enough to realize that you've launched a second instance of an image that already has pieces of it in physical memory and will automatically connect to the two virtual images to those same underlying physical pages, as we'll see. The important part of process startup and applications can also take advantage of that to share memory with one another. Now, let's continue defining our terms. On 32-bit windows, what is the virtual address space look like? Well, as you can see in the diagram, the default configuration on 32-bit windows is to divide the 32-bit address space in half. 2 gigabytes for each process and 2 gigabytes of virtual memory reserved for the operating system. Just like user applications need virtual memory to store code and data, the operating system also needs virtual address space to map itself, the device drivers that are configured to load, and also to store the data that is uh, maintained by the drivers in the operating system, the kernel memory heaps that we're going to explore later. Now that default of 2 gigabytes for the process and 2 gigabytes for the operating system was chosen when Windows NT was originally designed. And one of the things that influenced that was the original hardware architectures that Windows was ported to. One of them had a restriction that forced address translation at that 2 gigabyte barrier to be the same across all processes. Now, the x86 architecture didn't have that limitation, but to make the address space layout for the programmer look the same across all of the architectures that NT was running on, they chose to keep that division at the 2 gigabyte boundary. Once the support for that early processor architecture, the MIPS platform, was dropped, that requirement to keep the address space division at 2 gigabytes was dropped. And that's what permitted this variant address space layout that you now see on the slide that shows the ability to expand a process address space up to 3 gigabytes. This was an option added in Windows NT4 Service Pack 3 that uh, with a new boot at any switch slash 3GB would cause the operating system to shrink its own virtual address space to 1 gigabyte and then allow a user process to grow up to 3 gigabytes. And uh, in Server 2003, another switch was added to modify that, slash user VA, that lets you specify anywhere between 2 and 3 gigabytes. Obviously, there's a trade-off. If the operating system shrinks itself, there's less system address space for device drivers and system data structures. Now, even if you boot a system slash 3GB, or with slash user VA, if you run a vanilla application, it's still going to be limited by default to 2 gigabytes of virtual address space. And that's because the image has to be specially marked as large address space aware. That's a flag in the image header that the programmer would set on an application that's been tested to behave properly with an address space larger than 2 gigabytes. It's interesting that uh, this option to have a larger than 2 gigabyte address space is now supported on the client operating system on Windows XP as of Service Pack 2. Originally, it was targeted at server applications that needed to grow beyond the 2 gigabyte limit. But it's also just as likely that a client applications such as processing large digital pictures or simulation applications or games that need large amounts of virtual address space also would need more than 2 gigabytes. So the 3GB and user VA switch are now supported on XP as well as the server platforms. Well, even with the slash 3GB switch and the user VA switch, large memory intensive applications run up against that boundary of 2 or 3 gigabytes and for that reason six, Microsoft has made Windows available on 64-bit platforms. 64-bit platforms offer a much larger address space. In fact, 64-bit address space, which as we've seen is an extremely large number. As Dave mentioned, though, the current implementations of 64-bit uh, architectures limit the amount of virtual address space that the processor can address. And so, in fact, there's a lower current implementation limit to how big an address space can be. On x64 processors, they currently implement 40 bits of virtual address line, which limits them to a meager 262 terabytes of virtual address space. The IA64 processor architecture currently implements 50 bits of address space, and that is 1,000 terabytes. Now, if you look at the way that Windows utilizes these larger address spaces, you'll see that just a small fraction of that address space is used to map the kernel and device drivers, and another small fraction is used to map user processes. User processes on x64 platforms is 8 terabytes in size, and on i64 it's 7 terabytes, and you can see that 6 terabytes for system address space on both of those platforms. Where do these numbers get come from, by the way? Well, it turns out that the next version of Office, which is probably going to be out by the time you're watching this video, was determined that it that could fit with the .NET runtime in that 8 terabyte address space. No, Mark. Our office isn't really that bloated, is it? Uh, well, actually, no. Not really quite that bloated. The reason that the Microsoft came up with that is 
because the kernel internally implements uh, list data structure that, by the way it encodes the bits, makes it really necessary to limit the amount of address space that the kernel has available to it to that size, six terabytes, in order for the list data structure to work as implemented. And that's really a second order effect of the fact that today's 64-bit architectures do not provide an atomic 128-bit compare and ex interlock compare and exchange. They only provide 64-bit interlock compare and exchange. So as soon as the hardware platform has a more advanced interlocked instruction that safely allows modifying this list data structure, then Windows can go beyond the eight terabytes of address space. But if you think about it, eight terabytes, 8,000 gigabytes is a huge leap uh, from two gigabytes of virtual address space. So it's certainly going to be satisfactory for some time to come. Now it's important to remember that we're talking about virtual address space and 64-bit gets its advantage from the fact that there's larger virtual address space. And so applications that are very memory intensive can map more data into their address space at the same time, regardless of whether you've got a larger physical amount of memory than you would have had if you'd run it on a 32-bit system. The performance advantage comes from simply the mapping. And 64-bit in and of itself provides no inherent speed advantage otherwise. An application that uses less than its address space is likely to run just as fast on 32-bit systems as it would on a 64-bit system. There are a number of different counters that you'll be exposed to as you use various tools to monitor the memory usage of processes. Two of the counters are related to the virtual memory usage of the process, and those include the virtual size counters and the private bytes counters. A third counter is the working set counter, and that relates to physical memory usage. So let's dig in and take a look at these in a little more detail. The virtual size related counters, while interesting, are not really uh, that relevant to most memory leaks in a process. The total virtual size is the amount of the maximum address space provided to the process, which as we discussed on 32-bit systems is two gigabytes and sometimes can be larger if configured as such. Because the virtual size counter and performance monitor includes the code and the data and also reserved address space that the application has said to the memory manager that it might use in the future, it's difficult to look at this counter alone and determine if a process is unusually large. You might see a process with a several hundred megabyte virtual size, which doesn't mean that it's actually using that much because a good portion of that could have been reserved for future use, which in fact does not deduct from the critical system commit limit that we'll be discussing. Now this particular counter, because it's of narrow application and interest, is not available in Task Manager, but it can be configured with Process Explorer as a column. It's also available in the Process Properties. So just to look at one example, let's go and bring up uh, Process Explorer. And uh, let's look at Process Explorer itself with Process mm -hmm. Explorer, shall we? So I'm double-clicking on the 64-bit Process Explorer process, going to the Performance tab, and we can see looking at the memory counters that Process Explorer's virtual size is 100 megabytes. Interesting, but not terribly relevant in terms of memory troubleshooting. The next counter we're going to talk about is related to something a little more interesting when it comes to troubleshooting process behavior, and that is the private bytes counter. Private bytes are the amount of memory that the process is allocated that can't be shared with any other process, and hence the name. For example, if I bring up Notepad, and start typing, Notepad is allocating pages of virtual memory that are private to itself that can't be shared with anybody else. No other process on the system is interested in the text that I've been typing into Notepad at this point in time. So it turns out that if you're looking for memory leaks, it's really private bytes that you're interested in. And private bytes are shown in a few different ways. In Task Manager, if you bring up Task Manager, Actually, I, this uh, bears a little bit of explanation right here. Task Manager in the default view when you go to the Process tab shows you uh, one single memory-related column, and that is something it calls mem usage. Mem usage, therefore, is a commonly used column by systems administrators when they're looking for memory leaks. They'll sort by mem usage and figure that the process with the biggest mem usage is the leaker. In fact, that is not the virtual private memory usage of the processes, that is the physical memory that Windows has assigned to the process. And a leaker, uh, the amount of memory that a process leaks is not necessarily directly correlated to the amount of physical memory that Windows has assigned it. The counter or the column in Task Manager that is more useful for tracking down a memory leak is what's called the virtual memory size column, which is a little bit 
of uh, miss name is in its of itself because we just saw that process explorer shows you a virtual size counter and that represents the total amount of virtual address space both reserved and committed by the process in this case this is private bytes so let me just see if i got this right mark the vm size is not the vm size that's right vm and the size mem usage is not really the mem usage that's right okay we better stick with process explorer let's stick with process explorer which has a, names that are a little more easy to understand. Let me pull up Process Explorer. And by the way, to be fair here, the names that Process Explorer is using are the names of the performance counters that you would see if you were using the built-in performance monitor tool. Right. I didn't take it upon myself to come up with these labels. Windows actually internally uses those labels. For some reason, Task Manager uses its own. So I'm going to go to the Process Memory selection, and I'm going to choose Private Bytes right here, as well as Private Delta Bytes and Private Bytes History. All columns related to private bytes usage, usage that could be useful for troubleshooting a, a memory leaking application. So now if we sort by private bytes, oh, let me sort again to get the big, le biggest to the top, we can see in this case that PowerPoint has, is the largest consumer of private virtual memory. The private bytes delta shows that PowerPoint really isn't allocating or freeing. In fact, uh, here's one e example of a process. We just caught one there with a negative. It was freeing some virtual memory. And then the private bytes history column here shows you a relative comparison of the usage of private bytes of the process with respect to all of the other processes on the system. So it's now, kind of a weighted graph. Actually, this might be a good time to run that little test limit program just to watch a process that is slowly allocating private memory because Process Explorer will show that with a private delta right, and so let's, private byte history. Let's bring a, open a command prompt and I'm going to run a tool from sysinternals called test limit. It takes a, a test limit 64, I'm running on a 64-bit system, that takes a number of command line arguments that lets you leak different kinds of things or stress different kinds of limits in Windows. The one we're targeting here is the leak memory in specified megabytes, where every half a second it will leak, leak the amount of memory that you specify on that command line option. So let, test limit 64 minus M. I'm going to leak 500, no. No, that's too much. That's How about much. 5 megabytes? 5 megabytes of memory okay. each half second. So 10 megabytes total each second. Okay, and you can see the number down here. There it is. So it's already becoming the biggest consumer of private virtual memory, and you can see that's private bytes. We can also get a closer look at its private bytes history by going to the performance graph, and you can see a steady climb in the private bytes history of this process, indicating that you probably have a leaker. You shouldn't see a climb like that without it leveling off or subsequently declining. So that. Delta column mark, would you say that's really the one that's going to be the most obvious? It's going to stand and well, or the, the private Well, the combination, I think. Right, and the, look at the private delta bytes. You can see this is staying positive and staying present on every refresh, indicating that as we configured, test limit 64 is leaking 10 meg of memory every second. Okay, you better stop it before All we right, run out let's of virtual go ahead memory and mark. Kill that. And there we go. Gone. So all that memory got returned to the system? That's right. We don't have to like reboot? No. That or or run a, a memory optimizer. We'll see later how memory optimizers are really something advertising themselves as something that they're not. Now, had we not terminated that test limit application, how long could it have grown its virtual address space size? Well, either it's going to run out of virtual address space, which in this case would be unlikely because we're on 64-bit windows. That was a 64-bit process. It could have grown to a theoretical 8 terabytes, 8,000 gigabytes of virtual address space. We would have hit a limit sooner. And that's a very important limit related to memory leaks called the system commit limit. The system commit limit is the total amount of private virtual memory across all the processes in the system and also the operating system itself that the system can keep track of at any one time. And it's basically a function of two sizes, the size of the paging files on your system, and I said paging files because you can have more than one, plus most of the physical memory. The reason I say most of the physical memory is that when Windows boots, it does take some amount of physical memory for itself that can't be used for process virtual memory. That counter is called the commit limit. And uh, we can see the commit limit if we bring up Process Explorer and go to the View System Information display. And if you look on the lower left-hand corner, in the commit charge section, we see the current commit charge, the limit, and the peak. The limit is what we're focusing on now, is on Mark's system about 3.5 gigabytes. Now, I think you have about 2 gigabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. 
So that would mean that your paging file is about 1.5 gigabytes. Good, Dave. Now, shall we check that? Why don't you show me your page file size? All right, part? let's go look. I'm going to go to the system applet, which I'm gonna, I can get to by right clicking on my computer and going to properties, going to advanced, going to performance settings, going to really advanced, and then going down to the virtual memory. And it tells us, section, it tells us that the total paging file size for all drives at this point is 1.5 gigabytes, as you ca correctly calculated. Dave. Wow. Now, the third type of counter that we're going to talk about is not related to virtual memory at all. It's related to how much physical memory a process has. And Windows calls the amount of physical memory assigned to a process its working set. So when Windows is managing physical memory of the machine, it has to decide how much physical memory to give to each process on the system and also how much it should keep for itself to store cached data and also to keep as free. So the sizes of the working sets of individual processes are ultimately determined by the memory manager, though they're influenced by the behavior of the process. The memory manager will watch a process's uh, memory activity and decide based on that activity if it needs to grow or shrink with respect to other processes. So it tries to make everybody happy according to what they need. Now when a process is launched initially, it starts with an empty working set. Every process starts with an empty or zero size working set. As the thread or threads in that process begin to touch virtual addresses, the working set begins to grow, as you see illustrated in the diagram. Now, prior to Windows XP, this happened on a piecemeal page-by-page -page basis. So, for example, when you ran Solitaire the first time on Windows 2000, the first piece of Sol.exe referenced was read off the disk and brought into the working set. Then perhaps a piece of a DLL was referenced, that was read off the disk. Then perhaps another piece of Sol.exe was read off the disk. And as the images and memory map files that the application reference were touched during process started, they would be read in piecemeal on demand every time the process started. Now, of course, the second time you ran SOL, uh, the file data that was brought in the first time is cached, but still the process had to go through the same set of page faults to read things in as they were touched on demand. Windows XP introduces a new mechanism to speed application launching called the logical prefetcher. Mark, why don't you tell us about that? Well, Windows, in order to speed the pro uh, launching of an application, monitors the page faults the application incurs as it's starting up. And what does it define as the startup of an application? The first 10 seconds of the application's activity. And it saves a record of this information into a prefetch folder on the system. So I'm going to open the command prompt and cd into the prefetch folder, which lives under the Windows directory. If we do a dir, we'll see that there's lots of different applications or processes I've run for which prefetch information has been collected. For example, notepad.exe. We've run in this uh, session here, notepad.exe has a prefetch file for it that was collected the last time it ran. We can watch Windows and access the prefetch file and also write an updated prefetch file the next time we run notepad by going into Faramon, configuring a filter for .pf. I'm going to resume the capture, clear the display, and start a new instance of Notepad. And what we see is the first thing is Notepad reading its own prefetch file, which is going to happen during its startup as it is uh, faulting in or preparing to get that information, followed by, 10 seconds later, a service host process dump out new information to that same, pre same prefetch file. The reason that uh, you see this activity coming from a service host is that there's a built-in task in the task scheduler that is the prefetcher that reaches into the kernel, pulls out that trace information, and then writes it out to the log file for use the next time you launch the application. Also, that directory would not be accessible by a normal user, so a system process has to write that data there. And uh, there has been some bogus suggestions uh, in the press for tuning Windows XP that you should occasionally empty this prefetch directory. Is that going to make any difference for performance? Well, it sounds like from the way we've described it that uh, you're going to actually hurt Windows performance. Uh, uh, other than taking up some space on the disk, that is only helping the performance of the system. So there's a few ways you can look at the size of a working set. We've already seen one when we went to Task Manager's default column configuration. We saw that the mem usage column is configured by default. This is the amount of physical memory assigned to each of the processes on the system. So we can see on this current system that Explorer has assigned to it 33 megabytes of physical memory. In Process Explorer, we've got a more descriptive name for that value. If we go to the Process Memory tab, we can see working set size. 
and peak working set size will show us the largest, the most physical memory ever assigned to that process since it started. So I'll add those two columns, scroll over, and let's scroll by working set size. And again, look at that, the same value we saw in Task Manager, just with a label that's a little bit more informative. And the peak working set size shows us, oops, let me sort again. And it looks like I've got a bug in the, no? Uh, WinDBG. Yeah, WinDBG. WinDBG has the, was given the most, the Windows debugger that I had running, PowerPoint second, service host. So Explorer has the most currently, but at one point other processes had more. Windows has trimmed those processes down maybe as they've released virtual memory. It's given the physical memory backing that back to the pool for use by other, for other purposes. But the takeaway point here is that, again, if you bring up Task Manager, the only memory-related configuration uh, counter configured is the working set size. It's called mem usage. While it's interesting to look at that value, the process really is uh, has little control over that number. It's a uh, second-order effect of the kind of memory accesses the process is making, and it also is affected by what other processes are doing. In fact, you describe uh, this by the illustration of several people trying to fit in a room. Mm -hmm. So if you run multiple copies of Notepad, as we explained, Windows will share the same physical memory. But then if you launch more processes that need physical memory, Windows will assign physical memory to those other processes. Eventually, it run, might run out of physical memory to assign, and then it has to do a balancing act. Mark mentioned earlier that Windows automatically shares any memory that's shareable. So that would be pieces of executables and DLLs only one copy of any reusable part of an XE or a DLL is in memory at any one time. That's also true on a terminal server. So if you have several users logged into a terminal server, they all run a copy of Microsoft Outlook. There is only one copy of the pieces of Outlook.exe that have been brought in from the disk so far. Now, one user might bring a part of Outlook that nobody else has used. But if that's still resonant when another user goes to reference that part of Outlook, they'll automatically share those pages. But that's not just for code. That's also for all file data. So Word documents, Outlook PST files, Access databases, all of that uh, data is maintained in memory. And if there's two references from two different processes, the data is shared if it's shareable. And one of the things about this that makes the working set size number even less interesting than we've described so far is that it includes the shared pages. So you might have one process with a working set size of 100 megabytes, another process with a size of 50 megabytes, but perhaps they're each sharing 25 megabytes. So the total together, 100 plus 50, is 150, uh, when in fact the total physical memory really used is a smaller number because the working set size counts shared pages in each working set. Now, Mark, you've added some new columns in Process Explorer recently that show the breakdown of the working set. And there's three basic components of the working set. If we go back to Process Explorer, bring up the Process Properties dialog, let's say for Explorer, and go to the Performance tab, we can see the working set is broken down into three component parts, private, shareable, and shared. The private part of the working set is, represents the subset of the process's private virtual memory that is assigned to that process right now. Now, that doesn't mean that the other parts of the private part of that process are not in memory. They could be on some of the paging caches that we're going to describe later. They're just not in the working set as recently accessed. Shareable represents pieces of code or data that could be shared by another process but aren't being shared right now. And shared, of course, represents pieces of other code or file modules that are being shared by other processes. So it's worth emphasizing one more time that if you're looking for a memory leaker, you're not interested in task manager's mem usage or process explorer's working set columns or values. You're, what you're interested in is the private bytes value in process explorer or the virtual size value in task manager. The working set will grow up to a point. The memory manager will decide, hey, you've gotten big enough. The process keeps leaking virtual memory, but it's physically not using any more memory because the memory manager starts reusing the physical memory that the, was assigned to the process to store the new data that might, it might be referencing through that newly allocated virtual memory. So again, what you want to do when you're tracking down a memory leak is get into Process Explorer and sort by private bytes. And we'll talk a little bit more about troubleshooting memory leaks later and how you can identify a leaker by looking at this column. Now, one other aspect on process working set management is uh, going to tie us into the next section on the paging lists. And that's what happens when a process has its working set growing and growing and growing. The process is touching different virtual pages. They're being brought into the working set, as you see in the picture here. At some point, the memory manager says to this process, whoa there, fella, you're big enough. You're not the only process in town. There's other..." 
consumers of physical memory. So if you want to keep eating more pages or referencing new parts of your address space or new file data, then in order to keep you at an equilibrium size, the memory manager is going to take something away. So as the process requests a new page, the memory manager, as the diagram shows, uh, will take a page away. And of course, it takes the oldest pages first. So pieces of the working set that have not been accessed for the longest time are the first to be pulled out. Uh, when those pages are pulled out, however, they are not overwritten or zeroed or destroyed because they obviously represent a copy of data that was once being used by this process. So Windows keeps those on several uh, paging lists that we're going to explore in the next section. In order to understand some of the core Windows memory performance counters uh, that lead into being able to answer the question as to whether you need more memory or not, a very common question, we need to delve into the internals of how Windows organizes the memory that is not currently owned by a process. So this is memory that is not in a working set. The way the Windows Memory Manager keeps track of this is that it organizes this unassigned or unowned memory on four lists, the free page list, the modified list, the standby list, and the zero page list. Let's talk about the standby and modified page list first. When the memory manager pulls a page out of a process's working set, it's pulling out a page that that process hasn't said it doesn't need anymore. So in fact, the process may want to reuse it. And such a page is really kind of a piece of cached data. It's not in the process's working set. It's on one of these two lists, the modified or standby list, ready for reuse by that process if it would ask for it back, or ready for use by another process if it happen to, happens to represent code in an image or DLL that subsequently launches in a, in a different process. Now the list that the page goes to depends on whether it's been modified or not. If it's been written to, then the memory manager has to make sure that that page gets written back to the file that it came from. And that file might be a file from disk, for instance, a data file that's mapped into the process's address space. If the process modifies that page and then that page gets removed from the process's working set, the memory manager needs to make sure that that page eventually makes it back to that file on disk that was being modified. So in that case, it would go to the modified page list, or it's also called the dirty list. If the page hasn't, uh, has been modified and doesn't correspond to a mapped data file on disk, then it would represent private data to that process that it might want to reuse again. For instance, a page that you've typed some text into Notepad, if that page is pulled out of Notepad's process, then the memory manager would put it on the, mo the modified page list with the intent of eventually writing that out to the paging file so that it's there in the paging file in case uh, that me physical memory is reused and it needs to then go fetch that data back. It has a place where it's stored it. So modified pages go to the modified list. Pages that have not been modified go to the standby list. And after pages have been written back to disk, then those pages will end up moving from the modified list to the standby list, as we'll see when we go through the whole flow of paging dynamics. The pages that are brought back into a process's working set that are on the standby list or on the modified page list, those count as what are called soft faults, not paging file reads or not mapped file reads. Those are called soft faults because there's no disk I.O. involved. They're simply inserted back into the, the working set. If the data being referenced is no longer in memory because it's now out back on the file on disk out or out in the paging file, then the system would incur what's called a hard fault and have to go do a paging read operation to bring it back into memory. So one thing that's important there is that if you look at the process page fault counter, that's a sum total of all kinds of page faults, soft and hard. So a high page fault rate for a process doesn't really mean anything by itself because many of those could be resolved from RAM. In fact, all of them could be resolved from RAM. The system-wide paging counters let you look at page faults separately from page reads. But even those numbers can be misleading, as we're going to see later. Now another one of the four main free memory lists is called the free page list. The free page list, when the system boots, doesn't exist and only grows when private memory is returned to the system. Private memory would be a piece of a process address space, such as, again, a buffer that contains the text that you've typed in Notepad. Uh, when Notepad exits, whether you've saved that data or not, the memory inside the Notepad process address space that contains that private memory is returned to the free list. And that's memory that can never be seen by another process again. It would be a violation of Windows security fundamentals if, on a terminal server, one user runs Notepad, types some text, exits, 
another user runs Notepad, and when they start Notepad, they see from the start the text that was in somebody else's session. So private process memory uh, is never reused, uh, is never given back to another process without first being zeroed. This list, though, of free pages is the place the memory manager goes when it needs to perform a page read. Because when a page fault is occurring, the memory manager is going to do an I.O. that's going to overwrite completely the contents of a page. So when the memory manager has a page fault and it needs to find a free page to read a piece of a file in from the disk, it goes to the free list first, if there's anything there. On most systems, the free list is probably going to be very small or empty. It only grows when processes exit or some applications will delete private virtual memory that they no longer need. That's probably not happening on a frequent basis. And so uh, we're going to see later where Windows goes when the free list is empty. Now when the free list gets to a certain size, there's a kernel mode system thread, a piece of the operating system that is awoken called the zero page thread. And his job is to now zero these pages in the background. It's a very low priority thread. In fact, it's the only thread in the system running at priority zero. And uh, its uh, goal is to zero these dirty pages so that when and if Windows needs zero initialized pages, it's got them readily at hand. So the pages it puts those on, the zero page list, is used to satisfy, as Dave mentioned, zero page faults. So when an application needs to allocate a piece of private data that isn't going to be immediately overwritten with code or data read from a file on disk, then Windows will go and fetch the page from the zero page list because it's already been zeroed and the application can reuse it. When Notepad goes and allocates a piece of virtual memory for you to type, uh, for it to store the text you're typing into the window, it's going to be allocating zero paged, zeroed memory from the zero page list if there are pages available on it. This is actually the list where all physical memory starts out when the system boots. So all the pages are stored there and then they eventually make their way to the other list as Dave will show you in a second. On most busy systems, this list is totally empty as well because the pages on the zero page list eventually make their way into other pages, specifically the working sets of processes and the standby list, which is in some sense, as we've talked about, a cache of memory that's been used, been in a process working set, and might be reused at a later point and put back into a process working set. So eventually, if you start out, if you run your system for a while, all the pages will be pulled off the zero page list and be serving another more useful purpose in a working set or on the standby list. Now just to kind of put this all together, let's take a look at an overall diagram that shows the paging lists and how they connect with one another. As Mark mentioned, when Windows first initializes, all the memory starts out on the zero page list. None of the other lists exist yet. As processes come to life, as device drivers are initializing and being loaded, memory is being drawn from the zero page lists. In fact, it's easier to tell if you have too much memory than if you don't have enough, because if the zero list never gets drained, in effect, that means you haven't even referenced all the memory that was available to you. And we're going to see in a moment how to check the size of these individual lists with the kernel debugger. But let's assume that you've used all your memory. As Mark mentioned, memory is either going to be inside process working sets or uh, on the standby list or on the modified list. Now, the modified list is never allowed to grow to a very large size, just a few megabytes in size, because when that list gets to a certain size, it means that there's un saved data in memory that has not been saved to disk. So the modified page writer system threads are awoken when the modified page list gets to a minimal threshold and uh, it begins writing those pages out to disk, either to the map files they came from or for private process memory out to the paging file. So that's when outpaging occurs. Writing to the page file occurs only when the modified list reaches a certain threshold. That only happens when pages are taken from process working sets that aren't being referenced and that's only happening if some other process is demanding physical memory, causing the memory manager to need to trim or reduce the size of a process working set. Or a process that's paging itself that's reached its maximum, it's requesting new pages, and the memory manager is deducting uh, or debiting pages, taking away modified pages. And again, once those pages are written out to the paging file or to the map file, they still are a valid copy of something on the disk. They're simply moved to the standby list. So the standby list, again, reflects a copy of something that's already on the disk. That's another fancy way to say file cache. The standby list is really essentially the file cache in the system that the memory manager maintains. So the free list, typically empty, only grows at process exit. The zero list only grows when the free list grows. So if the free list isn't growing, the zero list will be empty and the free list will be mostly empty. So where does Windows find free memory? From the standby list.
The standby list is, in effect, two-faced memory. It's both file cache and free memory at the same time. It's free memory, or available memory is a better term, because nobody's using it. Anything on the standby list was used at one time, but isn't being used now, or it would be in a working set. So since it's not in use now, the memory manager can at any time take a page from the standby list, overwrite it, and use it for some other purpose. Of course, if later a process goes to reference that part of that file that was cached, a disk I.O. is going to occur. However, if the page is still on the standby list, it can be soft faulted back into a working set, again, providing a file cache mechanism. So as Dave pointed out, the lists that Windows can allocate from if a process needs a new, new piece of physical memory are the sum of the free list, the standby list, and the zero page list. And in fact, if you bring up Task Manager and go to the Performance tab, if you look down at the physical memory area, one of the values that it shows you is available memory, which in fact is the sum of those three lists. Another value that you see there is the system cache, which is one of those lists plus the working set of the system process. So it's the sum of the standby list plus the size of the system working set. And the system working set, which we haven't discussed at this point, is the currently in memory pieces of pageable kernel, code, drivers, and driver data, the driver heap, the page pool that we're going to talk about later. So Mark, let me just get see if I get this right. Your available memory on your 2 gig laptop is 1.5 gigs. That's right. So either you have cached a lot of file data, or you have way too much memory in your laptop. Well, you can see I've cached at most 500 megabytes, because the system cache is 500 megabytes in size. And let's just say that it's all standby list and none, no system working set. So basically, you have about a gig too much memory on the system. That's right what now. it would look like. And no, I'm not going to give you any. Oh, I was hoping to get a gigabyte back. But it's interesting that if you look at that available memory number, without looking at the division on the lists, you have no idea uh, whether it's memory that's never been used or memory that is helping you because it's all system cache. So to get that kind of breakdown, unfortunately, you need to turn your attention to the Windows kernel debugger. And what we've done is launch WinDebug from the Debugging Tools for Windows package, which is a free download from Microsoft's site. I've gone to File, Kernel Debug, which is great out here because I'm already debugging kernel, and chosen local kernel debug. So we're looking at this current live system. And I've typed in the, ba the command bang mem usage, which directs the kernel debugger to scan the data structures that the memory manager look, uh, uses to keep track of physical memory usage, and dump the size of the various lists that are stored or to keep track of that physical memory. And so you can see on my system, and we performed this a while ago, so these list values don't re reflect exactly what we just saw now in Task Manager, but I've got 1.2 gigabytes of memory on the zeroed page list. I've got 300 megabytes on the standby list, and you can see the free list is almost nothing, and the modified list is under two megabytes in size. Two megabytes is the base around the threshold where the now modified are, page writer would kick in. Well, I don't understand, Mark. That there's two columns there. What are the difference? Uh, the, the left column is the number of pages. The right column is the number of kilobytes. Okay. So in order that we don't have to do the, the multiplication there of four, four times the left number. So this is, again, confirming that you have way too much memory. That is confirming it, yeah. Yep. I need to run more stuff so okay. that you don't, you're not envious of my memory and think that I'm uh, wasting it. Got it. Having that clear understanding of available memory, the standby list, the free list, and the zero list, we're going to debunk a myth that there are add-on products that can somehow optimize or improve Windows' use of physical memory. You've probably all seen advertisement for them, maybe pop-ups. Click here to download memory optimizers, increase your free memory, free up physical memory. The myth that somehow the memory manager doesn't uh, uh, deallocate memory that's been used, that you need to kind of give it a kick in the rear somehow to cause it to free up memory that it's uh, holding off to the side. In effect, these memory optimizers all have one basic effect, zeroing out all your physical memory. So if you'd like to basically disable the effectiveness of your file cache, you're welcome to go install one of these things. And Mark, I think uh, you coined the term fraudware when you researched these so-called memory optimizers. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at how they work underneath the hood. I'm going to bring up a picture of before and after effects of a memory optimizer. So what we're seeing at the top here is the before view of physical memory. And the memory manager has assigned working sets to various processes I have running, Notepad, Word, and so on. The system has its own working set.
And then there's some small part of physical memory that's available. It's either on the zero page list, the free list, or the standby list. And would you say it's relatively safe to assume that if it's a system that's been up for a while, that available memory is probably 99% standby pages or right. file cache? Right. Or it's going to be very small if processes are very memory intensive. So the memory optimizer comes along, and what, the way that it optimizes memory, they advertise is optimizing periodically. So once every 10 seconds or so, it uh, will say that it's going to do some RAM optimization. It ev most even give you a button where you can say optimize RAM now to give you a feeling of power. The RAM optimizer fires up, figures out how much physical memory you've got in your machine, allocates virtual memory that's pretty close to that physical memory size, and then touches, simply reads the first byte of each page of that virtual memory. That causes a page fault and the memory manager is then to forced to give that process a piece of physical memory to back that virtual memory. The fact that the memory optimizer does this so quickly gives the memory manager an impression that this is a very memory hungry application and when it looks at its memory demands compared to the other processes you might have already have running, it decides that this one should be given some preference. It's so memory hungry it wants to make its working set larger than the rest of the processes so it shrinks the other guys down giving room from the RAM optimizer to grow into. And that causes those pages of those other process working sets to go to the standby list and then into the memory RAM optimizer's working set or go out to the paging file or simply be released if it happens to be data that could be refetched from a code image file or a map data file. Now that the optimization is done, the RAM optimizer freezes all the virtual, frees all the virtual memory it's allocated, and all of that memory then goes to the free list, which is one of the contributors to the available memory counter. So in the after view then, which you would see not in Task Manager because these things show you their own display, as I'll t explain in a second, the available memory counter will shoot through the roof. So you can see it was small, got even smaller, and then gets very large. So then they say, look how much memory we've made available for you. The reason that they have their own UIs to show you available memory is they omit this step right here of the available memory getting so small. They simply cut that out and the next thing you know, available memory has shot through the roof and you say, wow, that thing has really done a great job of doing what the memory manager should have done. When in fact, what's going to happen when you go back to those applications, Dave? Uh, as soon as you go and try to alt tab back to Notepad or to Microsoft Word, massive in paging operations to read back into memory all the pages that were needed by that process. So this is a great disk exerciser tool as well. <laughs> Flushes important information to the disk prematurely and then allows you to reread it again which you needed back in memory in the first place. So you have the illusion that you freed up memory. In fact, you basically zeroed most of your memory and the, basically the memory manager is keeping in RAM the most recently referenced pieces of files on your disk. It's hard to improve on that. So. The hundred thousand dollar question is, how do you tell if you need more memory? It's not a million dollar question, Dave. That's maybe getting close to a million dollars with inflation. Unfortunately, there's no simple answer. There's lots of articles out on the internet that suggest different performance counters to be looked at. In fact, many times uh, people point to the page read counter, the number of page reads per second. I've read articles that suggest if the hard page reads or page faults are c occurring on a frequent basis, that that indicates that you need more memory. That can be very misleading because normal file I.O. is actually executed by the memory manager satisfying page faults. So, for example, when you open an Outlook PST file or a Word document or a PowerPoint file or an Access database, the way that the data comes off the disk into RAM is via page faults. So a high page read rate per second may indicate just simply normal file I.O. A great example of that is if you copy with the copy program because that copy program maps in the source file into copy's address space and then creates a mapped output file and then basically touches its memory to fault that data from the source file into the t and then does a mem copy into the target files mapping in its address space. Each one of those copy operations is going to be a page fault regardless of how much physical memory you've got. Every time you run a copy and copy a large file like that, you're going to get a high number of page reads and adding more physical memory, are you going to improve the speed of that copy? No. Now you would if you were copying the same file multiple times because you could hold more, more of it in physical memory, but that's an example of how the counter can be misleading and not really reflect what you really need from a memory standpoint. Another example is when you run an exe you've never run before, the way the exe comes off the disk as we've described is via page faults. So adding more memory won't make starting an application you've never run before faster the first time. So the only simple test that Mark and I have come up with 
without requiring a lot more in-depth analysis, is to look at that available memory number. But now with an understanding of what it represents, if the available memory number is small a lot of the time, then you probably need more memory because that indicates that the system doesn't have enough memory to cache much. The standby list is relatively small. So if available memory drops down and then goes back up, no, that's not an indication. But if available memory stays small over a period of time, and that's a counter you can monitor with performance monitor, it's called available bytes. Uh, how small is small? You'll know it when you see it. Uh, we don't really have a percentage number, but something that is way below the normal baseline that you would see on your normally operating systems. If you really want to prove that you need more memory, the only way to do it is to trace the IOs and go back and look for reads and rereads to the same pieces of the same files. If you think about it, frequent reads to the same parts of the same files, whether those be exes, DLLs, data files, or the page file, that would indicate that there's not enough memory to keep in memory the frequently accessed data. But that's a pretty cumbersome process. So that's the best we can come up with. One very common question related to sizing memory related uh, factors on Windows systems is how to appropriately size the paging file. And typically, formulas are given as a multiplier of RAM. For example, RAM times 1.5 or 2 times RAM or RAM plus 50 megabytes. But if you think about it, the more RAM you have, the smaller page file you probably need. And that's because Windows would have less of a need to send modified private data to the paging file. The one case where RAM may influence the size of the page file is for Windows to be able to take a crash dump. If you want to take a full memory dump, obviously the system needs to be able to store all of RAM. And when Windows crashes, it writes the crash dump information to the paging file on the boot volume. So full memory dumps would require that the paging file be at least the size of RAM. Uh, a more reasonable crash dump configuration option is the kernel dump. Kernel memory dumps only require that Windows store kernel or operating system related memory, which is in the case of analyzing a crash dump, really the only relevant part. Process memory is typically not going to be uh, relevant to analyzing a kernel crash. So the kernel memory dump has a much smaller demand in terms of page file uh, sizing in the case of taking a crash dump. And on very large memory systems, really that's going to be the only option. For example, 64-bit servers today that have a terabyte of RAM, it's not reasonable to require a terabyte paging file in order to have a crash dump. So to size the page file correctly, we need to understand or review what gets sent to the paging file. So the only data, as Dave mentioned, that gets actually sent out to the paging file itself is modified private virtual memory. For example, the text you would type in a notepad, that is data that Windows, if it pulled it out of notepad's working set and it wanted to reuse that physical memory storing that text, would have to make sure that it's in some stable location on disk that it could then refetch it from, and that location is the paging file. If Notepad's code gets pulled out of Notepad's working set, Windows can simply reuse that physical memory without having to save it anywhere because it's already been saved on disk. It's in Notepad's image on disk. So code and mapped file data that comes from files other than the paging file can simply be reread from the disk without having to be sent to the paging file first. So when is data like Notepad's private pages sent out to the paging file only when necessary, only when it's been pulled out of a process working set and Windows needs to reuse that memory for another purpose. Something that can also trigger pages going out to the paging file is if the number of modified pages gets to be a number large, slightly larger than two megabytes in size. And at that point, the modified page writer will kick in and start sending that stuff out to the paging file, the reason being that it can then move those pages to the standby list and contribute to immediately available memory as we've seen. In fact, one interesting point, Mark, is that for a page to be read from the paging file, it has to not be referenced for a really long time. Private memory in a process working set would be taken out if unreferenced for a period of time, put on the modified list. If it remained unreferenced, it would then be sent to the paging file. However, at that point, as Mark explained, the page remains in memory on the standby list. If the process continued to not reference that page long enough for that page to cycle through all the pages on the standby list. Windows takes that page and uses it for another purpose, and then finally the process calls for that page. Only at that point would Windows have to reread that page from the paging file. So using FileMon in advanced mode, which displays paging file reads, it would be uh, another sign perhaps that you need more memory if you saw constant reads from the paging file. Memory has to really not be reused for a long time.
to be read back in from the paging file. Now, do you even need a paging file? That's another common myth. Windows does not need a paging file. Windows NT from the start has not needed a paging file. The embedded versions of Windows, starting with embedded NT4, uh, often are configured to have no paging file. They run completely from RAM. And Windows PE, the version of Windows provided to software and hardware vendors to provide a bootable CD-ROM, a bootable Windows environment off uh, uh, optical media, never has a page file. And that limits the amount of private virtual memory that can exist at any one time. It effectively limits the <coughs> utility of Windows PE. So the page file is there to allow Windows to dump modified private memory that has not been uh, deleted or saved to some other disk file onto the disk so that Windows can reuse that memory for other purposes. So if you don't have a page file, the system still can create virtual memory, but that private virtual memory is backed by physical memory. There's no place to dump the modified pages. So the modified list on a system with no page and file grows and grows and grows and grows. There is no place for the modified page writer to send that data. Ultimately, if a process continued to create private memory, the system would run out of virtual memory, when in fact what it really ran out of was physical memory. Now, although it's not intuitive, if you think about it, based on our explanation of the paging lists, it may actually improve performance to have a small paging file than to not have a paging file at all. Explain that one to me. Okay, think about this, Mark. If you have no paging file, you run a bunch of processes, they create private virtual memory, uh, those pages are put onto the modified list that aren't being referenced frequently anymore. Mm -hmm. The memory manager has no place to dump those. So now we have in RAM data that isn't being used anymore but can't be deleted because it's private memory to a process. If there was a small paging file, the memory manager could take that modified list, which again is a collection of pages that aren't being used anymore by processes, write them to disk, move those pages to the standby list, which means the memory manager can now take that because the standby list, as we explained, is also available memory, and reuse those pages for a more useful purpose, like another piece of uh, file cache or a piece of an exe or a DLL that goes into a process working set. So while there is some additional outpaging that might occur, the end result of having a page file versus not having one is that Windows can move out data that can't be erased or deleted but isn't being used anymore, thus making better use of the physical memory on the machine. Hmm. That's uh, definitely counterintuitive, but that makes sense. So let's talk about sizing the paging file. We've talked about the kind of data that goes to the paging file now. The worst case situation for how much paging file you'd need is if you summed up all the private virtual memory usages of all the processes running at any point in time on your system, and all of that got squeezed out at, from physical RAM to make use for other purposes. So that would be the size of the paging file required to hold the contents of private data that might be read back in by those processes again. That total sum of the private virtual memory usage of each process has zero connection with how much RAM you've got on the machine. It really depends on the behavior of the applications and the operating system virtual memory usage and your usage of those applications. If you run multiple applications at the same time, you'll need more paging file to store that private virtual memory than you would if you ran them sequentially. Now that number that Mark referred to, the total amount of committed private virtual memory that could be paged out, uh, which you might term the potential page file usage, is a number that Windows has at its disposal at any time. And it's called the system commit charge. It's a very important virtual memory related number. It's the total committed private virtual memory. It is in essence the sum of the private bytes of each process plus the size of the kernel memory private bytes, kernel memory paged pool. Now, if we go bring up uh, Task Manager, the commit charge shown on the performance tab on the lower left represents that total amount of committed private virtual memory. So on this system right now, there's 379,768 kilobytes of committed virtual memory. That's how much memory might be paged out. Now, Task Manager gives that number, same number, a different label. If you look at the upper left part of the screen, it says PF usage, 370 megabytes. The PF usage bar in Task Manager's performance tab is the commit charge total in a different unit. So in, why is it called PF usage? It really should be PPF, potential page file usage, because we have no idea how much of that 370 megabytes has been paged out. None of it could be paged out, or all of it could be paged out. And what would that bar look like if you ran on a system with no paging file at all? The same number. So if we rebooted your system, Mark, with no paging file, which given the 
large amount of memory you have and the small number of processes we're running, we could easily reboot and perform this entire presentation with no paging file. The PF usage bar would be the same number that we see right here if we rebooted and went through the same exact set of clicks to this point. Because again, the PF usage is really the total committed private virtual memory that could be paged out. No indication, there's no performance counter that shows how much of that has been paged out. Now there is a performance counter called percent page file used. That is an indication of page file usage. And that might be interesting to look at, but again, that's not necessarily an indication you need more memory. Looking, continuing on in the commit charge section, the second number, the commit charge limit, that's basically a function, as we mentioned, of the available memory on the machine plus the size of the paging files. However, the limit is not necessarily the limit if your page file is configured to have a minimum and a maximum size, like yours is on your mm -hmm. system right now. Your commit limit shows us 3.5 gigs, thereabouts. You've got 2 gigs of RAM. That would suggest that you have a 1.5 gigabyte page file. And that is true. <clears throat> your current page file minimum is 1.5 gigs. But if we go to your page file settings, let's go back to the page file settings that we looked at earlier. Right-click properties on my computer. Go to the Advanced tab, Performance Settings, Really Advanced. You better know what you're doing. Now we're going to click on the Virtual Memory Change button, and we're going to see, if we zoom this in, that you have configured a page file that has a minimum or initial size of 1.5 gigabytes and a maximum of 3 gigabytes. So our commit limit currently shown in Task Manager, if we go back and look at Task Manager's display, was uh, 3.5 gigabytes, 2 gigabytes of RAM and a 1.5 gig page file. But that's not really the limit because the page file is configured to expand an additional 1.5 uh, gigs. So the point is the limit is not the limit. The limit is the current size of the page file plus RAM, not the ultimate maximum size of the page file. We can kind of get a clue that that's the case because the commit charge peak is in fact 5 gigabytes. And that 5 gigabytes represents the maximum size of your paging file, which was 3 gigabytes, plus the 2 gigabytes of RAM. And again, that's most of RAM, not all of RAM. Now, how is it marked that we reached a commit charge peak of 5 gigabytes? You must have had a huge virtual memory demand at one time. I did, and we, I ran a tool that we're going to run in a little bit that just simply leaks virtual memory. And we're going to demonstrate that in, when we talk about memory leaks. But let's get back to the question of how big should our paging file be in the first place? And that determines how we size our paging file. So we've looked at the counters now that Windows keeps track of private, total private virtual memory usage. The most private virtual memory usage we've had at any point in time since we last booted the machine is the commit charge peak. So if you run your system under a pretty typical workload and you want to do some multiplication, Make your paging file that number, which is enough to hold all of the simultaneously allocated private virtual memory you had run uh, at any point in time. Multiply that by, say, 1.5 or 2. Uh, and like you see my, in my system, then if you want to re be really, really safe under high memory stress situations that you might not have anticipated, set your uh, paging file to grow so that if it, even if it exceeds that multiplied amount, that you've still got more slack space in those worst case situations. The paging file, once it's extended, will shrink back to its minimum size if the memory stored in that extended part of the paging file is subsequently freed. And that's what happened on this system. That memory intensive application ran, soaked up all of the virtual memory, caused the paging file to expand, and then released all that memory, and the Windows recognized that it could shrink the paging file back down to that minimum size. Same thing happens on a reboot. Windows will chop the paging file back down to its minimum size and let it grow again the next time if as needed. So just to summarize, sizing your page file, take the commit charge peak. Either use that number, add some small amount, multiply it if you want, but don't size your page file based on RAM. Size it based on the data that could go there, and that's private committed virtual memory. Look at the commit charge peak, choose that or some higher value. Now, one other topic on page files, Mark, is how important is it that the page file be contiguous? Uh, actually, the paging file should be contiguous. That can improve the performance of your system as Windows does writes out to the paging file. It does it in blocks, and if there's a, a break in pieces of the paging file between in one of those writes, Windows will have to break a single write into multiple writes. And there's a tool from Sysinternals called Page Defrag uh, 
which uh, I haven't yet ported to 64-bit, I'm embarrassed to say, so we can't run it and display it here. But page defrag defragments the paging file then uh, at system boot at what's called the boot time blue screen. It's where check disk would normally perform its checking of system disks. Page defrag configures a small native application that runs like check disk at that point in time before Windows is really up and running, before the paging file is in use, to use the standard defragmenting APIs to consolidate the paging file as much as it can. Some people get religious about having a fully defrag paging file. I mean, if your page file is divided into even several fragments, 10, 20, that's the least of your problems if your paging file is being accessed frequently. Would you agree? I'd agree. Only if you see that paging file is in several hundred fragments or uh, thousands I've seen before, that's when you should be concerned. And run paging, uh, page defrag once, basically, and you don't need to do it again unless you're changing the size of your paging file, which causes it to move around the disk. In this section, we're going to troubleshoot memory leaks. And there's several types of memory leaks we're going to take a look at. Process memory leaks, where an application is allocating private virtual memory and not releasing it. Indirect system memory leaks, where an application is allocating some resource and causing a leak of some non-related aspect of system memory. Or a direct system memory leak, where a driver of the operating itself is allocating buffers from kernel heaps and then never releasing them. One of the attributes that's common to all leakers, whether they're in kernel mode or user mode, is that the current allocations, if you look at how much of the resource the leaker has allocated, it's always close to or equal to the peak, and it's always going to be growing. The peak's going to be growing. If it's a significant leak, the peak allocations or bytes are very large. So you can have a small leaker where the peak is close to the current and always growing, but a significant leak you'll, will show up on the radar when you look across the system's memory usage or resource usage as something that stands out. And that's what you really have to be concerned about because it's at those kinds of leaks that can affect the performance of your system or the stability of your system. So let's start by looking at process memory leaks. We've discussed the difference between the various process memory counters, the working set size, private bytes, and virtual bytes. We know that a process memory leak is going to result in increasing private bytes and virtual bytes counter. Both will go up. The counter we recommend looking at is private bytes. Private bytes represents the private virtual memory allocated by a process. And if that number is increasing, that indicates a potential memory leak. Uh, what does not necessarily indicate a memory leak is a large working set size, which Task Manager calls that MIM usage column. Now, if a process continues to allocate virtual memory, allocate virtual memory, allocate virtual memory, it will ultimately reach the system commit limit. That's the sum of the page file size plus most of RAM. And the way Windows reports that to the user has changed over time. We have a couple of pictures of systems that have reached their commit limit that uh, Mark is going to bring up now. So this is a picture of a billboard, an electronic digital billboard on the side of Macy's on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And it's uh, run out of virtual memory. Windows has displayed a dialog box, which you can kind of read part of the message there. It says your system is low on virtual memory, Windows is increasing the size of your paging file during this process. Memory requests for some applications may fail. So this is the message box that comes up when uh, Windows has reached the first initial minimum size and begins expanding the page file. I think this happened, Mark, on one of the major sales at Macy's one day. It was a Too many people buying things. Yep, at the cashiers. Here's another one. This happens to be uh, the Paris Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. And it also has a digital display there underneath its balloon. And you can kind of see it says system process out of virtual memory. So this is the error message that you get after Windows has exhausted all of the commit available to it. Its paging files are completely full. And what's ridiculous about this message, Mark, is if you've seen it before, it says system process out of virtual memory. In fact, I think we have a better view on the next picture here. This was a, a Windows system that was running a billboard that had ran out. And I was driving and saw this and <laughs> Almost got an accident, out. Didn't you? Yeah, I climbed up the ladder and I was looking for the console so that I could bring up Task Manager and try to diagnose this. Now, if you read the text there, it says system process out of virtual memory. Your system is running low in virtual memory. Uh, and then it suggests that you increase the size of the paging file and reboot. But if you have a memory leak, you increase the size of the page file and reboot. All you're going to do is delay getting this message the next time. So it is so easy to go examine, if there is a process memory leak, who the leaker is. Again, go back to look at the process paging, uh, process private bytes counter, which Task Manager calls the VM size, Process Explorer calls it private bytes. Now let's demonstrate actually a process with a serious memory leak. Uh, 
So I brought up a command prompt, and I'm going to run that test limit program we ran earlier. This time, I'm going to cause it to leak a little bit faster, Dave, so that it exhausts all of virtual memory, causes the commit limit to grow as the paging file is expanded and eventually runs out. So I'm going to leak by how much do you think? Shall we say 200, 250 megs? 250 megs. Now, before you start that, let's get Process Explorer up, okay. get the system information display. So I just hit Control-I. This is similar to Task Manager's Performance tab. So let's have this visible, ready to go when you hit Enter. Okay, here I go. I'm going to switch back very quickly. And we see the commit charge. It's current growing, going up. Growing. We see the limit going up. The page file is expanding right now, and we're out. And, we if, you, and if you look back behind us, it says uh, test limit stopped allocating private virtual memory, and it got back an error from Windows. The paging file is too small for this operation to complete. That's not coming from test limit. That's an actual Windows error message. Now, we didn't get in Windows XP and later, sometimes you'll see the system out of virtual memory as a balloon uh, coming up from the tray. Uh, we actually saw that earlier in preparing for this demonstration. Uh, sometimes that appears, sometimes it doesn't. Could be that Windows didn't have enough virtual memory to display the tooltip. Yeah, and for sure, if we started to try to launch things, we we're probably going to get some bizarre behaviors, including weird error messages. Let's go back and look at the Disk Process Explorer process view. We've got the private bytes column added, and we've got it sorted by that, and we can e very clearly see exactly who's leaking memory. We can look both at the private bytes counter and the private bytes history and see that this process has way more committed memory, committed private virtual memory allocated than any other process on the system. You can see the relative scaling here. This thing just blows the other guys away. And this is our leaker. This is what you would see if you were really doing a leaking troubleshoot, shooting an uh, experiment. And now what you would do at this case, terminate the process. So Dave, you want to have the honors here? Well, before I do that, I'd like one last time to go back to Task Manager, go to the process list, sort by mem usage. And uh, we'll see that while we have this very, very large process that owns a huge amount of virtual memory, its working set size is remarkably tiny. Wow. It has a working set size of 1.4 megs. So sort by mem usage, and let's see where it shows up in the list. There it is. It's, it's not even on oh, the top. Wow. So if we look at the mem usage sort, and again, most administrators, because that's all that's there, that's all they might be aware of, they're looking at the mem usage column. Systems run out of virtual memory, they sort by mem usage. In fact, the leaker doesn't even show up in the top 20. The proper column to sort by, the VM size, which is not configured by default. There's our leaker. Now can I get rid of it? Yep. Delete. So oh. what would you do if that was one of your production applications that you were running on your server? Uh, I probably wouldn't just kill it, but I would call one of the developers, have them go try to look at the process address space with a debugger, maybe get a memory snapshot, let them go triage it. Now if we go back and look at the system commit limit, bring up Task Manager, go to the Performance tab, and now we can see if we look in the lower left, the commit charge has dropped back down to our normal baseline value. The limit also dropped from 5 gigabytes back to 3.5 gigs because, as you explained, Windows returned that page file extension back to the system. Our peak reflects that peak mm -hmm. of the total page file being maxed out. Another type of leak you can run into is one that doesn't directly affect the committed virtual memory. It might affect system kernel memory, one of the system kernel heaps, or it could indirectly affect system virtual memory without being private virtual memory uh, explicitly allocated by the process, and that is a handle leak. A handle is an, a reference to an open operating system resource, such as a file, a register key, a TCP IP port, a device, and processes that open these resources get handles allocated for them. If they never close the resource, they end up exhausting system memory as the system is allocating memory to store the data associated with those objects that it process has open handles for, or simply to store the memory used to keep track of the process's handle table. There's no built-in limit in Windows as far as how many handles or how many objects can be created. We'll see that there is a built-in limit on the number of handles each individual process can create, but no system-wide global limit on the number of handles that all of the processes in the system as a whole, as a, in combination can allocate. The fixed limit for per-process handles is roughly 16 million. 16 million handles per process. So again, one process could create 16 million handles. Another process could create an additional 16 million handles. And because the table that Windows maintains to keep track of open handles comes from a system-wide memory resource called page pool that we're going to describe shortly, 
indirectly, a process handle leak, which is a simple bug in a user application, could ultimately exhaust kernel memory, causing the system to come to its knees, not being able to launch processes. File opens will fail. Device drivers may start having failures at unexpected points. In fact, it could even lead to data corruption. Now, we can demonstrate this going back to use your test limit tool. I'll bring up a, that command prompt. And uh, one of the options of test limit is to leak handles. It's the minus H option. And what this causes Mark's test program to do is to create a single object, but open handles to the same object repeatedly. So this is an example of how a process handle table growth causes kernel memory consumption. So we're not creating millions of objects. We're creating one object, but we're creating millions of handles to the same object. So I'm going to do a test limit 64 minus H. Before I hit enter, I'm going to bring Process Explorer back, go to the view system information, and let's watch when I start this handle leak, which of the memory numbers on this display start to increase. Here we go. Now, right now, this process is creating handles like crazy. We have 500,000 handles and growing. If we go back to Process Explorer and look carefully, in the kernel memory section, we can see that the paged kernel memory area is going up. Non-paged is not really changing. And this is because as the process is creating handles, the operating system is extending the handle table for that process, and that extension is coming out of kernel memory page pool. Now, Mark's 64-bit system has a quite large page memory limit of 3 point, almost 3.5 gigabytes. So probably this process is going to uh, be able to create 16 million handles without exhausting page memory. But if I launched another instance of test limit 64 using the minus H, that process could create maybe another 16 million handles. And again and again and again. But ultimately, we would exhaust kernel memory non-page pool. And this is kind of a serious uh, resource exhaustion issue with Windows because it means that a simple bug in a user application, I just press Control C. And by the way, when a process exits, Windows closes all the open handles. So that's a temporary workaround for a handle leak is kill the process. All the handles get closed. But the issue here is that a non-privileged application that doesn't require admin rights could, given a handle leak, fill kernel memory and cause a denial of service on, for example, a terminal server. So well, another way that you can determine that you've got a handle leak besides looking for something like page pool or non-page pool usage is to go back to the system information dialog and the handle count will be high. And if we, one of the num uh, ways that we saw that when Dave was running that test limit example is this handle count we saw grow up into the millions. As it was running, I saw it reach up to into the six millions before Dave finally terminated it. So what you would do is get to this dialog here, notice that you've got a handle problem, and then return to the process view to figure out which process is leaking the handles. And you do, do that by going to the column selector, going to the process performance, and selecting the handle count column. I'm going to go over here and let's see who's got a lot of handles open. So I've sorted by the handle count and this service hosting process is the one with the most handles. Now this isn't leaking. We don't see this continuously growing. It's a fixed number. But if this were a leaker, we would have just identified that leaker. And as Dave mentioned, a temporary workaround is simply to terminate that process. Another way that you can find out, dig deeper into the process to figure out which type of handle is leaking is to open up the handle view in Process Explorer by opening the lower pane. And this shows you the handles that are open by this particular process. It shows you, by default, only the named handles. So only resources that have names associated with them are going to be displayed here. And it, your leaker might be leaking unnamed resources. Test limit, for example, leaked unnamed resources or handles to unnamed resources. So to see all of the handles that are open by this process, we need to go to the View menu, Show Unnamed Handles and Mappings, check that. And now we can see a whole lot of unnamed handles. Let me scroll up here, showing up in the display that have been opened by this particular process. And I think the service host might be opening and closing handles. What well, we saw some green, and that represents handles that have been opened but never uh, closed. And red would represent a handle that's been closed. Let's talk, take a closer look at that, that feature of Process Explorer, which is called difference highlighting, by finding a command prompt. Let's see if I've got one running down here. Here's a command prompt. Let's look at its handle table. And we can see that it's got an open handle to this Windows System32 directory. I'm going to open up that command prompt and change directories. And let's change to the temp directory for something interesting. What we're going to see is command prompt close 
that current handle to its current directory, Windows System 32, will show up in red in the handle view, and a new handle will be created that shows up in green that will point at C colon temp. And there, in fact, we see exactly that. So a handle leaker would exhibit a lot of green or more green than it would red. And I think, Dave, you ran into a, a real-world situation that you troubleshooted or troubleshot, I don't know how you say that, where you found a leaking application and yes. were able to tell the developer exactly what they were leaking. I noticed over time, I happened to be looking at that system information dialog and I saw my system-wide handle count had climbed to a number that I just didn't remember seeing so high. So again, uh, as Mark suggested, I went to the process list, I sorted my handles, looked at the process with the most number of handles, and there was a third-party application that had been installed on my laptop that had an unusually large number of handles, and that number was going up by one every second. Obviously, a handle leak. But instead of just reporting that there was a handle leak in this application, I then enabled the lower pane. I'm pressing Control-L, that's the keyboard shortcut, and I just kind of scrolled around till I saw green, and when I saw green, I stopped, and I had found the object that was being leaked, and lo and behold, I saw every second a green line being added to the display, and it was a named event object. So I was able to report to the developer that there was a handle leak, that they were not closing the handle to a named event object called XYZ, and that certainly narrowed down the problem for the developer to solve. And they did solve it and issued an update that cleared up the problem. Did they thank you? No, they didn't thank me. That's not right. Now, we've mentioned several times kernel memory, page pool, non-page pool. What is kernel memory? Kernel memory represents the heaps, the variable size range of memory that the operating system and drivers can allocate for system-wide persistent data. So just like an individual process might allocate memory to store information, like Notepad when you're typing the text, stores that in private memory. Likewise, the operating system and device drivers need to store information about their state, system status, events that are occurring. So they allocate from the private memory heaps that the kernel provides to the rest of the system. And there's two types of memory heaps. One is non-paged and one is paged. The reason that there is a non-paged memory heap or non-paged pool is for the case where device drivers need to access memory while processing or servicing an interrupt. Due to the synchronization rules of the Windows Memory Manager, uh, device drivers, when servicing an interrupt, are not permitted to reference pageable data. The Memory Manager is not in a state where it can resolve a page fault. And in fact, that's a common device driver programming bug, a reference to a piece of pageable memory while processing an interrupt, which causes an immediate blue screen. And in our crash, uh, video, we explain how to analyze those kind of blue screens and pinpoint the driver responsible. Paged pool represents the part of kernel memory that could be paged out. It doesn't mean it will be. And just like private process memory that doesn't get referenced for a long time, it will ultimately get paged out so the memory can be used for more useful purposes. Likewise, kernel memory paged pool allocations, if they're not referenced anymore, will migrate out of the system working set onto the modified list, and then if they remain there, ultimately get written out to the paging file. Now, non-page and page pool do represent, in essence, a limit of how much stuff can be going on, how many processes can exist, how many threads, how many files can be opened, how many drivers can be loaded. So Windows determines what it considers to be the optimal maximum for non-page and page pool at boot time, and it's basically a function of the RAM on your machine, uh, and also the product type or the version of Windows. Are you running the server version or the client version? Uh, these calculations can be overridden by registry values underneath HK local machine, system current control set, session manager, memory management, but it would be unusual to need to modify those values. Even though Windows sets sizes of the non-page pool and pool, uh, page pool as it boots, there are some theoretical maximum upper limits of those. So let's say that Windows decided that non-page pool was the most important memory resource for it to allocate, and it decided to give it as much as it could. On a 32-bit system, non-page pool would have a theoretical level limit at most 256 meg megabytes in size. And by the way, in NT4, that was actually 128 megabytes. It's doubled since then. And on 64-bit systems, though, you'll see that the number's grown tremendously, and this is a benefit of the increased virtual address space on this uh, on 64-bit systems. 128 gigabytes is the theoretical upper limit. Now, we already know that non-page pool has a direct correlation to physical memory. So really, if you've got four gigabytes of physical memory on a 64-bit system, in this case, I've got two gigabytes on this system, non-page pool is actually limited to something much smaller than that theoretical maximum. But if we had a terabyte of memory, 
Windows might decide to give non-pitchpool up to 128 gigabytes of that. PagePool has similar types of theoretical upper bounds. On 32-bit systems, X, Windows XP has a, a theoretical upper limit of 470 megabytes and 650 megabytes on server 2003. So you can see Microsoft's been trying to grow those theoretical upper bounds to accommodate larger and larger workloads that Windows is subject to as time goes on, larger and larger terminal server systems, for example. On 64-bit systems, again, a theoretical upper bound of 128 gigabytes which is going to be capped by your virtual memory commit. So obviously if you don't have enough paging file to store all that, plus your physical memory size, you're not going to be able to take advantage of those really high numbers. But they're designed there for really large memory systems. Now one of the things that Microsoft is doing with Windows Vista that demonstrates that they're still committed to uh, supporting and extending the scalability of 32-bit systems is that these kernel memory heaps, their limits have basically been removed removed in that there's no artificial limit that keeps on 32-bit windows non-page pool to 256 megs or page pool to the 470 or 650 megs. The system space memory management code has been extended and enhanced in Windows Vista to allow either of those memory pools to grow to the theoretical virtual address space size available to the kernel, which is by default two gigabytes. Now obviously non-page pool plus page pool plus the rest of kernel memory still has to add up to two gigabytes. But these particular memory areas now can grow beyond the previous limits that were limiting, again, as Mark said, some of the larger terminal server environments. Now, if you look at the basic performance counters that uh, allow you to examine the size of the kernel memory pools, they only display the current size. There are no performance counters for the maximum size of non-page pool or the maximum size of page pool. This uh, is a pretty important uh, piece of data for the health of a server because if you, for example, bring up Task Manager, go to the Performance tab, and simply look at the kernel memory numbers on the Performance tab, it's hard to make a value judgment on the kernel memory numbers because while this is showing me the current usage, I have no idea what the maximum is. So I don't know if I'm using 10% or 50% or I'm about to run out. Process Explorer, however, has the ability to display the limits because Process Explorer is reaching into kernel memory to pull out some numbers that you can also examine with the kernel debugger. So let's go over to Process Explorer and we'll see if I bring up the system information dialog, clicking on View, System Information, that in the kernel memory section, Mark is showing not only the virtual size of page pool, but also the physical size. Task Manager doesn't show that, although Performance Monitor provides access to that. But more importantly, the limit the limit of page pool and the limit of non-page pool. Now, Mark, your 64-bit, 2-gigabyte laptop has configured itself to have a maximum non-page pool limit of 872 megabytes. The theoretical limit of non-page pool, as you mentioned, was 128 gigabytes, but you obviously don't have that much RAM. However, you only have 2 gigabytes of RAM, yet you have a 3.5, roughly, gigabyte page pool limit, and that's because Windows knows that there is a page file that it can go send some of the unused or unreferenced uh, kernel memory page pool. So those page pool limit and non-page pool limit numbers are very important to look at at least once for the health of, health of your servers. You should set some kind of alarm or threshold on the performance counters which indicate the current size so that if they go above some baseline you're alerted before you run out because when you run out of kernel memory basically your system is toast. You can't run anything anymore to troubleshoot why you run out of kernel memory. So you need to know well in advance of running out before uh, the system runs out so that you can go do some troubleshooting. Which leads us into how do you troubleshoot a kernel memory pool leak. There are a couple of basic approaches to dealing with uh, kernel memory pool leaks. So this is the scenario where you see kernel memory page pool slowly increasing or kernel memory non-page pool increasing. One is to use a tool that was introduced in Windows 2000 called Driver Verifier. And we'll talk more about how that can be used for troubleshooting the pool leak in a moment. The other is to use a tool that's been around for a long time called Poolmon. Mark, can you tell us about Poolmon? Poolmon is a tool that comes in the uh, Windows support tools. And it requires, or it uh, requires that you've turned on something a priori in order for it to be able to can correlate page pool and non-page pool usage with the driver that has made the allocation. That in data tracking that you have to have enabled is something called pool tagging. 
Pool tagging is the facility by which an application, or a, sorry, a driver or the kernel can associate a four character word with the pool allocation it's making. And that four character word is used to uh, identify the purpose of that pool and uh, for you to be able to look at and track the number of allocations of that type of pool block and the number of freeze and potentially track down a leak. You first have to turn on pool tracking with uh, the pool, uh, the G-Flags tool, which comes from the resource kit. And it, it's also in the support tools now. It's also in the support tools. There's an option in G-Flags. Let's pull up G-Flags for tracking pool tagging, which is down, shown down here. I've just checked it. And that requires you to reboot the machine. Now, I'm running on a 64-bit system, which is using the 5.2 kernel, which is also underlies the Server 2003 code base, even for 32-bit systems. And so I didn't have to turn that on in order to get pool tracking on, because by default on Windows Server 2003 and 64-bit XP for x64, that tag is automatically turned on, just because it's so common for people to need to be able to troubleshoot pool leaks that uh, it's enabled so you don't have to go configure it, the reboot, and then hope to get the leak back and be able to troubleshoot it. So, just a point there, it's, it is safe. Microsoft has basically said it's okay to have pool tagging on, on all your systems. So you could go turn it on in your XP systems or wait on your 32-bit systems till you have the condition of needing to troubleshoot a pool leak, but you will need to reboot before you can do this troubleshooting we're about to look at. Let's bring up Pullmon, and I'm going to go to the Start menu and type Pullmon. The Support Tools puts itself on our path, so we can simply launch it this way. And uh, what it comes up in is in a sort order that's not very interesting. First, let's take a look at the columns. The Tag column shows us the pool allocation tag, and that's the default sort, is by pool allocation tag. The type, whether it's non-paged pool or paged pool. The number of allocations according to that particular pool tag, the number of freeze the difference between the allocations and the freeze, and the number of total bytes that are currently outstanding for that pool tag. A much more useful sort is the bytes column, and I can simply type B, and that causes Poolmon to sort by bytes. And when you're tracking down a pool leaker, that is typically what you want to sort by. You're going to be tracking down somebody that's having an impact on your non-page pool or page pool. It's typically going to have much more allocated than other components or other drivers on the system. Let's see who's allocated the most here. It's MMPD as the tag. It's a paged pool block. And we've got how much do we have allocated there, Dave? 15 megabytes 15 or so. 15 megabytes. Mm -hmm. So nothing too concerning. But nevertheless, if this was a leaker, that might be what the tag that we're interested in tracking down. Shall we make a pool leak? Sure, let's make a pool leak. And I've got a tool that I've written, which we've seen a few times already, not my fault. Let's bring up Not My Fault. Now, Not My Fault is a pretty dangerous program to use uh, because clicking the default button that you've highlighted there, Mark, the Do Bug button, is going to cause an immediate blue screen. Right, so we don't want to do that. What we're going to go after here is Leak Pool. So I'm going to press the Leak Pool button. And now, Not My Fault is going to start leaking pool according and using a certain tag to leak that pool. Let's see if it shows up here in the display. Well, actually, you know what? Poolmon only refreshes once every five seconds. I'm going to force the refresh by hitting the space bar. And any line that has a change in it is highlighted in that highlighted gray color. Mm. And you can see every time I press it, there's somebody that's climbing, or that was climbing, and will be oh. climbing up. There it goes. Who is that? Let's take a closer look. That's a very strangely named pool tag there, Mark. Yeah. It's, uh, the pool tag is L-E-A-K. Hmm. Suspicious, isn't it? It is. Now, well, were this a real pool leak, we probably wouldn't be running Poolmon. We'd probably have either Task Manager or Process Explorer System Information Dialog up, or maybe you have a performance monitor job that's monitoring the pool sizes. And if we look closely in the kernel memory section towards the middle, we do see paged kernel memory going up slowly. And this is because Mark's device driver is allocating, 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 but not freeing. Were we to leave this alone, and not stop the leak, ultimately it would exhaust all of page kernel memory and the system again would become unusable. We couldn't launch any processes. So were this a real leak, we'd see page pool going up, we'd run poolmon, and uh, we'd look at the display for some pool tag that uh, seemed to have a rising or increasing total number of bytes. And we can see the third line on the display right now, the pool tag leak, uh, has appeared out of nowhere and it's going up 
the number in parentheses on the very last part of the line shows the delta on the refresh, which is happening by default every five seconds. Now it's up to almost nine megabytes. It was not even on the display before. Were this a real pool leak, your next question would be, who is the pool tag LEAK? And that takes us into describing how to map pool tags back to the drivers that are using them. To find the pool tag, uh, your first place to look is inside a text file that is provided with the Windows debugging tools called pooltag.txt. So let's bring up Explorer, go to the C, Program Files, Debugging Tools for Windows, Triage subfolder. And in this folder is a file called pooltag.txt, current as of the version of the debugging tools that we have installed. If I double click and look at this file with Notepad, we can see that this file lists the tags used for pool allocations by kernel mode components and drivers. That really should say and Microsoft drivers because there is no way for a third party driver to register their pool tag. Some third party drivers pick pool tags that are obvious, some pick less than obvious pool tags. But if it was a Microsoft driver or an operating system component, we could search this. And for example, if I search for LEAK, obviously we're not going to find that in pooltag.txt. So the first place to look is pooltag.txt. Probably it's not going to be there because let's assume the leak is from a third party driver. So how do we find out which drivers are using what pool tags? Well, Mark's strings tool from sysinternals is kind of a brute force way to look for the pool tag text inside the driver binaries. The other option is to use uh, a newer version of Poolmon that comes with the Windows device driver kit that can actually look inside the driver binaries and generate a local pool tag.txt. But let's go ahead and run the strings tool, hoping that we're going to find the driver that has the text LEAK, which now is at the top of the list. You're up now, Mark, to almost 19 megabytes, 19 wow. megabytes of page pool. I think we better stop leaking now just yep. so we don't run out. So I'm going to press the stop leaking button. Now let's go back to a command prompt and uh, do a search of all the drivers looking for the string LEAK. Now I know that most of the drivers on the system are stored in the Windows System 32 drivers folder. So we're going to kind of hope that Mark's driver is there. So we're going to run strings from sysinternals on star.sys. That's the default extension for a driver binary. And we're going to pipe the output to the find string command and ask find string to highlight any lines that have LEAK, case sensitive. Here we go, searching through the drivers, searching through the drivers. And lo and behold, it found the hit in the file myfault.sys, had the pool tag LEAK. Mark, I found your leak. Darn, I hope to fly under the radar. You just have too much skill, Dave. By the way, Mark has uh, what I consider a bug in this program because now when I exit this, he doesn't even free up the memory. That's a permanent pool leak, by the way, folks. That is not going to go away until you reboot. It's a real pool leak. Now, that was relatively straightforward. We found the tag in the driver binary in the obvious place where drivers are located. However, drivers can be loaded from just about anywhere. It's up to the individual component as to where it wants to store the driver to load. And drivers that load at boot time have to be under the Windows directory uh, someplace. But drivers that load later in, in the system's life cycle like Process Explorer's own driver can be loaded from any other location on the whole system. So the question is, where are the drivers being loaded from? And there's a few different tools that come with Windows and that are also available as add-ons that will show you where drivers are loading from. One of them is MS Info 32. Let me launch MS Info 32. Whoops, a little typo. Another little typo, MS Info 32. And this takes a second to come up. It's using WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation, to query the system. If we go to Software Environment, System Drivers, it will show us the list of drivers installed on the system and, in some cases, where that driver is stored on disk. And you can see some cases I'm saying because some of them, MS Info 32 simply just doesn't know, which isn't terribly helpful. Let's take a look at Process Explorer's system process which is where I've artificially associated loaded system modules. It makes sense that uh, this association would take place and that you would see it with the DLL view, which I'm going to open up here by clicking on the View DLLs button, and see the modules loaded into the system process, the full list of drivers. And if we hover the tooltip over any one of these, we see the full path 
to that image. And I mentioned Process Explorer's driver comes from someplace else on the system. In fact, Process Explorer points the image points at C Windows System 32 drivers proc apps 100.sys. If we were to actually go to that location on our system, we're not going to see it. And that's because Process Explorer extracts its driver, loads it into memory, and then deletes the image from disk to clean itself up. So that begs the question, how do we troubleshoot leaks from drivers that we can't find to do a strings of? So because some drivers are deleted after being loaded, we need another way to look at the loaded drivers on the system. And uh, Process Explorer's DLL view is one, but in the kernel debugger, the kernel debugger has a way to dump all the loaded modules using the lmkv command. So I'm going to go back to the instance of the kernel debugger we used earlier to look at kernel memory statistics and use the lmkv command, which dumps the loaded kernel module list. And I'm scrolling up, and I see the first loaded module in the system is the operating system itself. Now, due to a small bug in the kernel debugger, to get the full list, I need to type dot reload nt. Maybe that'll be fixed by the time you're trying this on your system. I'm going to go back into the lmkv. Dot reload, I'm sorry. And then LMKV. And now we see the kernel debugger listing out all the loaded kernel modules and where accessible, the version number information, the location on disk where it was loaded from. So those are a few ways to find where the loaded drivers are or drivers that have been loaded on your system. However, drivers that have been deleted cannot be searched for their strings. So that takes us to our last uh, step for troubleshooting the pool leak, and that's using Driver Verifier. Driver Verifier's main purpose is to help driver developers find bugs in their own code or to help system administrators turn unsolvable crash dumps into easily solvable crash dumps by performing rigorous verification of what drivers are doing when they talk to the operating system. But Driver Verifier has one option that causes the system to keep track of how much memory has been allocated by each driver so instead of having to do the work of mapping pool tags back to the driver that uses the pool tag, driver verifier makes it easy to see, given a certain driver, how much memory has that driver used. So because we've configured driver verifier already to verify Mark's myfault.sys driver, so I run verifier, verifier.exe. I click on display information about the currently verified drivers, click next. We can see that one driver is being verified, myfault.sys. I click next. The first display are global system-wide counters. And then if I go to the next and final display, I see a list of the drivers that are being verified. And here I can see that my fault .sys allocated 20 megabytes of pool, uh, but has not deallocated corresponding 20 megabytes of pool, thus pinning down the leaker to be my fault .sys. So this would be a way, to, again, to look for memory leaks by drivers that the pool tag is not either obvious or available to determine who the leaker is.